Welcome. We're off to a little bit of a late start, but that's, that's just fine. Uh, our first speaker this morning is uh, Bill Huggins from uh, Google. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining me on the morning of the last day. Uh, I know I would have loved to sleep in, so I appreciate, appreciate everyone joining me. And also, thank you to the organizers. This has been a really wonderful workshop. I'm sure some excellent ideas will come out of it. Uh, so I thought that I would pick a title like this uh, because it gives me an excuse to talk about some of our recent work on actually demonstrating chemical calculations on these near-term processors. Uh, but it also gives me a chance to inject some wild speculation along the way. So if you disagree with anything, uh, you know, I'd love to hear about it afterwards. Um, but before I get started, I just want to say thank you to a few folks. I won't list all of the authors on some of these papers, uh, but the whole Google Quantum AI team that you know, built both the processor and the environment to, to work in wouldn't be here without them. Uh, and then there a few of the experiments that I'll tell you about, there are some folks that were especially impactful uh, Tom O'Brien and, and Nicholas Rubin led this demonstration of error mitigation, which I'll tell you about shortly, which is truly a heroic effort. Uh, and then I had the pleasure of, of going to graduate school with Brian O'Gorman and, and Jun Ho Lee, and that ultimately led to this, this last paper, which I'll tell you about later in the talk. Um, so with that, uh, I want to say one thing first about what a useful quantum, quantum chemical calculation on one of these processors might look like, and, and that's that it, it just might not exist. Uh, we might not be able to do something useful, for, especially for chemistry, before we get to error correction. And, and I think it's important to face that fact. Uh, and probably a lot of you have seen uh, a graph like this, or perhaps even this same graph. Uh, and really what it's showing you is our belief about what the most probable path is, at least for Google and for our superconducting qubits, to get to an error-corrected useful quantum computer. Uh, and, and really what you see is that we're looking at the qubits that we have now and the processors, and we're thinking about improving them maybe an order of magnitude and then just building them way larger. Uh, and there's a real question about whether this blue region, which we skirt of, of near-term applications, really belongs there. I think that's really what we're all here to answer. Uh, and even if you think it does belong there, it's definitely possible that applications to quantum chemistry maybe you know, way off the bottom of, of the chart there somewhere, and that we won't see them until we get to an error-corrected machine. Uh, you know, so that said, uh, I think it's, it's worth taking a minute to tell you about generally what our roadmap looks like, at least at a high level. Uh, we have a plan to build an error-corrected quantum computer. And, and at least if you count the milestones, we're already a third of the way there. Uh, I'll leave that uh, to other folks to decide if that's really true. Uh, but we have gotten to this demonstration uh, that we were really excited about uh, demonstrating what we call a logical qubit prototype. And, and what we mean by that is that we basically showed that uh, we can build uh, a very small surface code, a distance three and then a distance five surface code. And by increasing the code distance, we can see a small decrease in the error rate. Uh, so that's this gray milestone two up here. Uh, and the wonderful thing about error correction is that we don't have to get that much better before we start seeing the really friendly exponential kick in. So we think that roughly a two-fold improvement in device performance, which you could do in a hand-wavy way, but we've also thought about this carefully in, in terms of different real sources of error. You know, that, that two-fold improvement is going to get us to something like this blue curve, where we're already seeing a substantial decrease as we increase the code distance. Uh, and then it's not that much further in, until we really see this exponential behavior kick in in a way that enables fault-tolerant quantum computing, at least that, not that much further in, in terms of suppressing those error rates. Uh, so we're confident that this can be done, uh, but along the way, we're going to have plenty of noisy qubits and wondering what, we, you know, what can we do with them that's interesting. Uh, and I, I think before I dive into what we have done and, and what we're thinking about, it's useful just to do some back-of-the-envelope calculations about why we ultimately will need quantum error correction. Uh, it should come as no surprise to anyone here that when we have a circuit, you know, here I'm talking about maybe 200 qubits, but some reasonable number. Uh, but when we have a circuit and each component is, is sensitive, uh, you know, has some probability of error, that ultimately if we use a circuit like this to do something like evaluate an expectation value, that we're exponentially sensitive to error if we don't do any kind of error mitigation. Uh, and that, you know, even if we start thinking about error mitigation, and here I'd just like to imagine some kind of platonic ideal rather than the techniques we have in practice where we can just detect every time we run a circuit if an error has happened or not, 
and we can throw those runs away. Um, even if we have such a perfect error mitigation method available and get these kind of results. Uh, and furthermore, you'll note that there is some improvement with system size, which is, is nice to see because you know, in practice, we would love to go to larger and larger system sizes if we can. Um, before I jump to the experimental results, I, I want to say that looking even at how well this performs numerically, I think it suggests something uh, which might be controversial, but maybe not. Uh, I think that we may have to be happy in the NIST era, if we can do anything, we may have to be happy with qualitative results. I mean, the method I showed you on the last slide uh, has some residual bias, but even other error mitigation methods, which in, in principle don't, uh, in practice, it's going to be very difficult to get some arbitrary level of accuracy, uh, or it's four, five, six digits of precision without bias for some, some observable that you might care about, especially in a chemical context. And sorry, x axis was like number of errors? So oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, I normalized everything by the expected number of errors so that I could compare different system sizes in some reasonable way. But yeah, 10 to the 0 is about the one error per, per execution sweet spot that we think a lot of error mitigation methods have a, have a chance of performing well. Yeah, thanks. I, I would love to have, have more questions as we go. I know it makes it tricky to record them, but I think it's more fun that way. Um, OK, so I, I said that we may have to be happy with qualitative results. I'll, I'll come back to this point. Uh, but I want to tell you about our experimental results implementing this, these error mitigation methods. Uh, and we cheated a little bit in that we considered a simpler model system than, than the real chemical Hamiltonian. Uh, in particular, we looked at this richardson godin model of superconductivity, uh, which um, does include electronic correlation, but only in a limited sense. It's a pairing model that goes beyond um, this non-interacting BCS theory that, that some of you may be familiar with, uh, but it still simplifies the interactions to, to just these ones that involve correlated pairs of electrons. Uh, and what we did is we looked, in, in this case, at a 10 qubit system, and, and we asked how well can we recover either the, the energy or this order parameter delta um, by performing these kind of error mitigation techniques. Uh, and we were pretty happy with the way these results worked out in practice, even given sort of all of the mess of actually running an experiment. Uh, in both of these quantities, we were able to see one to two orders of magnitude improvement across the board. Um, and you know, in particular, when we look at this space transition here, if you were just looking at the blue points, which are the, the raw VQE data without any error mitigation, you know, maybe it's qualitatively correct, but you you barely see this kink that you would expect at g is equal to 0. Um, whereas if you actually go and you perform these error mitigation techniques, either the virtual distillation and error suppression by derangement in these yellow, yellow points, or the echo verification, which unprepares the state and, and somehow uses that to, to do these row squared estimates as well, um, then we really pretty accurately, at least qualitatively, capture this phase transition. Um, and you could imagine a similar level of accuracy on a much larger calculation you know, telling you something about nature, which, which ideally you didn't understand before. And that we're a long way from that, of course, but um, so we're happy with how this performed. Um, but, you know. So this is VQE on 10 qubits? Yeah. How many iterations was the size of here? OK. Uh, this is a point which I, I was going to circle to in a, a minute, but it's a good one to make. Uh, here, we didn't optimize the ansatz on the quantum computer. We went up to six qubits doing the optimization and fully on the quantum device. And what we saw was that it, it just got very painful. So here we spent a considerable amount of time and effort obtaining you know, these series of data points given the ideal parameters from a, a classical optimization. Uh, and what's the size of the so it, it scales is, is roughly n squared. There's a prefactor that depends on how many particles are in, in your system. But um, we were restricting ourselves to this linear depth because, you know, again, any, anything deeper than that could be quite, quite challenging. Um, and, and this linear depth is really natural, at least in this restricted model uh, of, of electronic correlation. How do you model the fermionic uh, nature of the electron? How do you put in? Yeah, so what we do is we actually use one qubit to represent a spatial orbital that's occupied or not occupied by a pair of electrons. Uh, so uh, any two qubit interaction then is actually a, a two body interaction between. Um, so yeah, in this problem, 
single electron never shows up. Uh, you only have pairs. Yeah, in, in the way that we encoded it on a device, that, that's true. You only have, only have these pairs by construction. Um, great. So uh, one thing I'll, I'll say that I think this experiment really drove home for me is that scaling up to things that are even close to classically intractable are probably going to require better fidelities. Uh, and you know, I can explain that by talking a little bit about what we saw in terms of scaling. Uh, if you look at this bottom left plot, we plotted a bunch of different measures that allow us to approximate what the fidelity is uh, in, in different senses as we go from, say, a four qubit experiment, eight, six, six eight, 10. And, and we're already seeing this characteristic exponential decay that, that you would expect uh, when you have noisy gates and, and noisy components. Whoa. I don't think that was me. Um, the projector may have gone to sleep. It's on? Yeah, so I mean, maybe I'll continue without the plots, because I think the point is, is sort of independent of, of the details. Uh, we did this thought experiment um, where we said, look, we were pretty happy with the 10 qubit results that we got once we were able to layer on these error mitigation techniques. Uh, so let's just imagine that uh, the overall fidelity of the circuit stays constant as we go from 10 to 50 qubits. Uh, and so this is basically assuming that we uh, get some kind of 25-fold decrease in the error rates, which it, it may be a lot to ask for in, in some sense. Uh, but you know, even if we make that generous assumption that, that that's what happens, um, and this corresponds to two qubit gate fidelities of something like 3 times 10 to the minus 4, uh, we could ask how long would it take to get a data point from this larger experiment, you know, given the overhead from the error mitigation uh, and from just measuring the Hamiltonian of these larger systems. And, and that's already at the point where measurements for one of those data points would take hours. And so it's hard to imagine, uh, even if you're willing to pay more overhead for, for lower fidelities, that they'd be able to carry out an experiment like this at much larger scales without those improved fidelities or some other, other kind of technique. Um, and, and I just want to say that if we did the full sort of electronic structure Hamiltonian, rather than this model of, of chemistry or material science, that it's going to be harder. Uh, it will be harder for a variety of reasons, one of which is that we might require deeper circuits to do something meaningful. But even forgetting that, everything just becomes more expensive to measure. And the precision that you might ask it, is actually much higher as well. So the time that it would, it would take these experiments could grow infeasibly large. Um, so you know, not, not to be a, a complete downer. Um, I think one of the morals of, of this experiment uh, and of, of thinking carefully about what can we do with chemistry in general is that it would just be great if we asked less of the quantum computer. Very accurately estimating uh, expectation values to uh, very large circuits in a way that approximates something with that, without noise, that, that's just a lot to ask of these noisy devices. And it would be much better if, if we could get away with some more qualitative information. Uh, and you could imagine doing that when you're looking, say, for a phase transition. But what about if you're actually interested in some uh, the energy or you know, some chemical property that depends on the energy or its derivatives? Uh, well, um, this is what led us to thinking about a different kind of hybrid quantum classical algorithm that you know, rather than, than starting from variational optimization, um, we start from this idea of imaginary time evolution, which uh, in a nutshell, if, if you imagine that you can apply the e to the minus tau h to some state which has non-vanishing overlap with the ground state. Uh, oh. Sorry. Uh, you imagine that you can do that as you, is this thing, yep, is this thing still working? Yeah. Well. We're use the second one. Here. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, so you, you imagine that you can do this, and, and as you increase tau, as you go further in imaginary time, you exponentially suppress the occupation of the higher lying energy levels. You know, now, I'm not here to tell you to do exponentially large matrix algebra on your classical computer. If you want to do that, you can without my advice. 
but you know, classically, people have thought about how to do these kind of things without storing and manipulating objects that are exponentially large in the size of the Hilbert space. And, and most famously, there's these projector quantum Monte Carlo methods that, in a sense, they approximate the wave function as an ensemble average of simpler Walker wave functions. Uh, and, and these kind of techniques actually efficiently solve some ground state problems that would otherwise be out of reach. Most famously, there's the Bose-Einstein condensation of, of helium-4. And you can really understand this with computer simulations on computers much less powerful than the ones we have today using, using a, a technique that actually takes this idea and, and implements it. Uh, however, if you try and apply the same thing to fermionic systems, you run into uh, a problem that's notorious enough that it actually has its own name in Wikipedia article, the fermion sign problem, or, or the phase problem in some contexts, uh, is a description of, of what happens when you're trying to do these Monte Carlo methods to find the ground state of a fermionic system. And rather than this exact imaginary time evolution, you see something perhaps like this, where the variance of your estimators diverge as you, you step forward in time. Uh, or perhaps you just get a completely unphysical solution, uh, depending on the flavor of, of Monte Carlo that you're trying. And, and really, we don't expect a general solution to this problem. Uh, there are plenty of Hamiltonians whose ground states we don't think we can approximate with a quantum or a classical computer. Um, but we might hope to do something in particular physical systems where we have some intuition about the ground state. Uh, and, and that leads us to this idea that folks have explored for decades now of controlling the sign problem using a trial wave function. And the idea is that you take some a priori approximation to the ground state that doesn't have to be very good, crucially, uh, and you enforce some condition on your Walker wave functions. Uh, technically, you, you usually enforce that their overlap with this trial wave function stays positive. Uh, and this modifies this whole imaginary time evolution procedure in a way that is going to introduce a bias that depends on your trial wave function. Uh, and so that's a problem that you might, you might worry about. But in some cases, this is OK. Uh, and also, you know, there's this problem that evaluating those overlaps might be intractable. If the overlaps can be evaluated efficiently, then you recover a polynomially scaling approach, uh, but only when, when you can do that efficiently. Uh, and this prevents you in some situations from doing what you might like to do as a numerical practitioner of, of systematically improving these trial wave functions until you get results converged to something that you're happy with. And so uh, it was about you know, this point um, that my collaborator, Jun Ho Lee, was, was working on these methods classically. And he said, you know, hey, Bill, you told me that quantum computers are very good at evaluating inner products or overlaps. Um, I should have said approximating. I think I said evaluating. There's a big difference. Um, but you know, in any case, it, it suggests this idea, which is that you know, maybe we can prepare an approximation to the ground state on our quantum computer that's sort of from a much richer class of things, and we know how to treat tractably classically. Uh, and then we can evaluate these overlaps using something like the Hadamard test or more efficient techniques. Um, and we evaluate, we get this overlap then, at least if you ignore the noise, up to some additive error. Uh, and this is better than what we know how to do classically in a lot of situations. It turns out that the additive error is quite problematic if you think about scaling up uh, to large enough system sizes, although at small and medium system sizes, it, it's not such a big deal. But really, you would prefer a relative error. But that's that's unfortunately off the table. Um, but you, know, you could try and do this anyway. You say you'll accept some approximations, and you'll just see how well you can use a quantum computer to guide one of these Monte Carlo calculations. Um, and that's exactly what we set out to do. Uh, and, and at first, we were thinking we were going to have to couple some classical supercomputer running this calculation to our quantum processor. And it was going to be a painful experiment. Uh, and then this really wonderful paper came out. Uh, this predicting many properties of a quantum system from very few measurements that introduced the formalism of classical shadows uh, and gave us a tool that is actually simplifies our experiment dramatically. Uh, and what it lets us do is we can characterize a state, here a superposition of the zero state and the trial wave function, uh, using these classical shadows, which I won't have time to review. Um, but I, I can say what they do for us, which is that you know, once we we take a bunch of randomized measurements of this state on our quantum computer. Uh, then we have everything we need to reconstruct any of the overlaps we'd like afterwards offline in classical post-processing. And so we can use the data from the processor uh, to, in a very sample efficient way, 
to drive our Monte Carlo calculation and, and sort of do this messy procedure of using the overlap calculations to, to eliminate the components of the, of the ensemble that would lead to this exponential blow up. Uh, and there's another exponential overhead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, what do you know about the, the size of these? Like, how much do you assume if you know its properties, or do you assume that it's sort of an unknown state? Um, you assume in a very hand wavy way that it is qualitatively similar to the ground state. I mean, if, if it has nothing to do with the ground state, you're not helping yourself, really. Um, but otherwise, you just, I mean, at a very practical level, you just see what happens. Uh, you can say things a little bit more strongly in some settings, like if oh, you, you sort of are getting a variational approximation in a sense. but. But we don't assume much. We just. Um, how, do you, how do you know if you get to or not? That's a great question. Uh, ultimately, you don't know. One thing that you can do in practice is you can stop applying this procedure of, of controlling things with the trial wave function and see how quickly things go wrong. Like you start to see a variance that builds and builds, but, but oftentimes you can distinguish between a wrong answer and, and a right answer by, by looking at things. But, but ultimately, you may have to compare to experiment and see if you're getting useful data that, that tells you something about the real world. Um, so I just do want to say, uh, before I move on, that there is another exponential scaling here, at least in the original experiment that we performed, which is that this post-processing, even though it's sample efficient, using the classical shadow to do this, uh, requires an exponential amount, it, it would seem, of classical post-processing. This is an exponential scaling that we've actually fixed in a subsequent paper, uh, which I'm happy to talk about offline, but, but it was there in our original work. Um, and so you know, what does this experiment do for us? Well, it, it does one thing, which I, I, we mentioned briefly in a question. Uh, we actually avoid having this outer optimization loop. And you, know, you could tell me, like, hey, OK, I, I hear that you didn't optimize things on the quantum computer. But didn't you need to get that trial wave function from somewhere? Uh, it's actually a nice property of these methods that there are situations where you can get a trial wave function with a classically tractable procedure. Uh, but evaluating those overlaps on a classical computer is intractable, or at least we don't know how to do it. And so there is still a, a realm where you benefit um, even without, you know, you're, not, you're not cheating. You're really you're just benefiting from being able to use the quantum device to evaluate these overlaps, even though you had to do the optimization classically. Estimate. Estimate, yeah, thank you. I, <laughs> yeah, additive error and, and relative error are much different things. Um, OK, so we decided that we would see how well this actually works in, in an experiment. And we picked our favorite model system, which is easy to solve. It's just four hydrogen atoms uh, in a square. But it also is representative somehow of challenges that you see in, in real chemical problems. Uh, and then we picked a, a ansatz that isn't that important for our purposes, but it's some rough approximation to a chemically meaningful couple cluster. Um, and we just optimized that classically. Uh, and then we treated a couple of different problems here. One of them is that we looked at an eight qubit Hilbert space, which corresponds to taking these four hydrogen atoms and really aggressively discretizing space so that everything fits onto eight qubits. Uh, but we also were able to do something which is, is kind of nice and out of reach for a lot of other methods, which is, yeah, five minutes? OK, great, thank you. Uh, which is that we're able to try and solve this entire problem on a much larger Hilbert space, but still only treating a small portion of it on the quantum computer. So in this case, uh, we solve it in a space that would be 240 qubits if we represented it exactly. But we're getting most of those almost for free in, in a perturbative sense. Um, but I'll, I'll move quickly to use my time efficiently the last few minutes here. Uh, but I do want to pause before I show you how well this worked and, and show you what happens when we just look at the data from the quantum computer and calculate the energy of that wave function directly without feeding it to our Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, and what you see is that all of these blue points are very far from this orange band, which I'm, I'm calling chemical accuracy, is roughly the region around the exact answer that we'd like to be in to have any hope of solving chemical problems. Uh, and so they're, they're quite far. Uh, they're not bad, but they're quite far. And, and we actually know on the left-hand side that it should be exact in the absence of noise. This ansatz would exactly prepare the ground state. 
Uh, but we can take these wave functions, uh, nevertheless, and use them to drive this Monte Carlo calculation. Uh, and what we see is that uh, we basically erase the variation between these experiments, uh, and we get far more accurate answers. In, in this case, for eight qubits, we're within chemical accuracy ac across the board if we take enough measurements. Um, and this is really encouraging. Uh, despite the fact that we were suffering from plenty of noise, the, somehow the classical algorithm that we were using was able to clean up a lot of this by just taking advantage of the qualitative features of the data from the quantum device. Um, and this, this really is one of the things I think we would love for algorithms on these NIST machines is that somehow, even if you don't do error mitigation, it would be wonderful if they tolerate a high level of error, whatever your objective is. Uh, I'm going to uh, glance a little bit quickly past the 12 and 16 qubit results. Uh, I do just want to say one thing about them. Here, we're, we're plotting similar things uh, in a slightly different way. But the most exciting thing about these plots is that if we look at the black and the red points in, in both figures, uh, they're really quite close to each other. And, and the red points are what we get from doing this procedure of using the Monte Carlo algorithm with our experimental data. Uh, and the black points are what we would get if we ran the same Monte Carlo algorithm with the wave function we intended to prepare on the device. Uh, and the fact that these are so close is telling us that the noise on the device was not yet the limiting factor at this scale. And, and that was really wonderful to see because it gives us some hope without improving the fidelities uh, yet of, of going to slightly larger system sizes. And that's something we're excited about and, and working on, although it's tricky to find the right application in a sense. Um, so I think I'll, I'll close maybe uh, by throwing a, a different sort of wild statement out there which is that I really think, at least to be useful for chemical problems as we scale up, that we need something new between error mitigation and, and error correction. And, and I'm coming at this not from any principled point, but sort of from an aesthetic point of view that we have this wonderful family of error mitigation techniques that have very low constant factors, but ultimately some exponential overhead. Uh, and we have these quantum error correction tools that have very high constant factors and stringent precision requirements but only a polylogarithmic overhead. And, and you know, I sit here looking at these things, and when I think about my 1,000 or my 10,000 noisy qubits, I would really love something in the middle with medium constant factors and a polynomial overhead. You know, if one of you invents that thing and gives it to me, I would be really excited to try some of these chemical problems uh, and, and have a little bit more hope for, for being able to do them before we get to this error-corrected regime. Uh, so with that, I'll just say thank you so much for uh, for listening and for your questions in the middle. I really enjoyed it. Uh, we obviously have a long road to go um, and plenty of time to have artists paint nice interpretations of, of the path before us. Uh, and I'd love to find interesting sites with you all along the way. So thank you.